We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna ask you to stay standing real quick. I saw all you trying to sit down on me. Um, we've been doing what we've been calling the flipperoo. Um, so that's a new word. And we have been starting with the sermon during this past four-week series. And we like to start every time off with the doxology. So I just wanna invite you to sing along with me. Uh, the words should be up on the screen, okay? So let's sing this together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let's sing that more time. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God, we say this is your house. And this is your space. And we want you to do whatever it is on your heart to do. Would there be a a humility and a teachability and a softness given to us right now that would go against anything in our flesh, anything in our past, anything in our will that would want to resist you. But God, we humble ourselves and say, may your word go forth and have its full authority, full weight, full impact of transformation on each and every one of us. We long, long to be like you. So come and change us and make us like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good to be with you all. We're excited for what God is doing in this house. Um, I don't know how many, but we have over 100 people uh, on a camping trip this weekend. So I pray that they're staying dry. I heard that there's a lot of cows in the area and that all night there was mooing. I don't know. That's just the rumor. Uh, I hope it doesn't smell like cows. I could handle the noise. I don't know if I could handle the smell, but hopefully they're having a a good time. Uh, Blessings to them. But um, this is our our last Sunday that we're we're speaking specifically on being a people of his presence. Um, This is a series that we believe God has called us to that is a marking of us as Antioch. This isn't to say that other churches and other groups aren't people of his presence, but I would say that... um, if you've been with us in this journey, especially for a longer period of time, you know, we planned the church in 2011, whether it was in a living room or it was in some little, the Tempe Women's Club where like, you know, the empty nesters would play bridge and maybe they'd like rent it out for like a little dance class on the parquet floors to meeting at other churches to the, the point where we met here. Something that has been consistent and true of this family is that the presence of God is experienced. And I'm so thankful. I mean, what else matters, right? Like, I don't, I mean, worship, you guys are amazing, but whatever, like, you know, sermon, preaching, it's okay, but whatever. But presence of God, that's where I wanna be. Like, man, if the Lord is there, if God's moving, if God's speaking, if if God is there, that's where I wanna be. And I can just say with with great humility and gratitude, like that has been something that's marked us. And we are wholeheartedly, unswervingly committed to continually being a people of his presence. Whatever comes our way, whatever future has for, for us, for, for America, for the world, whatever comes our way, one thing that we're unwavering from is we want to be those who can tend to be in the presence of God. And so we've been talking about this. We've been talking about what it means to be in the presence of God. We've talked about creating spaces for the presence of God. But this morning, what I want to talk about is being a carrier of the presence of God. 
What does it look like for you, not just in this moment, which I can say God's presence is here now, that, that he is with us, that he is for us, that he wants to do something in and through us right here, right now, but he has that same longing the moment you get in your car and you drive off this property, that there is a carrying and a stewarding and an agreeing and abiding. There's all these words about us, biblical words about us having his presence with us everywhere we go all the time. But how frequent, how often are we aware of it? There's this book I read a long time ago. Maybe some of you have heard of it. It's called Practicing His Presence by Brother Lawrence. It's a classic. It's a great book. And, and it's, you know, it's about this 17th century monk in Paris who uh, he basically he, he made it his aim and his life's ambition to be conscious, uh, conscious of and aware of the presence of God 24-7. Like that was like his life's endeavor. I want to be always aware of the presence of God. And he doesn't claim that like he does it perfectly or anything else, but, but he's kind of famous because he was the dishwasher of the monastery. And so he'd be in there and he'd be washing dishes and spending time with God and people would come in and be like, you know, Brother Lawrence, it's time for us to go pray, you know? And they'd have to go to the chapel and he'd be like, time to go, what are you talking about? Like, I've been with God all day. Like, I don't, I don't need to go to a chapel. I don't need to have a formal meeting for me to be able to steward and abide and carry the presence of God. And so that's been his endeavor. And it's, it's just something that stirred me. And I just want to read a, a quick excerpt from this book. And this is what it says. I cannot imagine how religious persons can live satisfied without the practice of the presence of God. For my part, I keep myself retired with him in the depth and center of my soul as much as I can. And while I am so with him, I fear nothing. I want to read that one more time because I want it to sink in a little bit. I cannot imagine how religious persons, churchy people, people who claim I'm spiritual, I'm a, I'm a, maybe I'm a Christian, I don't know, whatever religious person you might want to fill in the gap there. I cannot imagine how a religious person can live satisfied without the practicing of the presence of God. For my part, I keep myself retired with him and the depth and the center of my soul as much as I can and while I'm so with him, I fear nothing. There are religious people missing the presence of God. They know a lot about the Lord, but they don't know much of him personally. They don't know what it looks like to like, sit with him. I, I can talk to someone, oh, you know, I can say, tell me what you know about the Bible, about Christianity, and they can give me a list. I'll say, okay, tell me what God's been teaching you lately. Or tell me about your time with God. And all of a sudden, it starts to feel very unfamiliar and it feels very uncomfortable. And God is saying, I'm not satisfied with you knowing about me. I want you to know me. I'm not okay with you talking about me. I want you to talk to me. I'm not okay with you doing religious activities from time to time. I want you to actually carry my presence everywhere you go. Like I'm on you or you are on me or however you want to picture that in your mind, but we are enmeshed with one another in the way that we do life. This is what God longs to do. And so when I talk about the presence of God, I just, I want to bring a little clarity to it. it I'm not, when the Bible talks about the presence of God and when we talk about the presence of God, we're not talking uh, just about some vapor or cloud. We're talking about a person, the Holy Spirit. So let's just get real clear. The Holy Spirit is the Trinity, the part of the triune God. We believe in one God who has three persons. Hurts the head, I know, but that's biblically how it's described. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they each have their own personhood, yet it's still one God. And so when we talk about carrying the presence of God, we're talking about the Holy Spirit manifesting himself, being on our being when we move and live and breathe. That's, I'm trying to be real specific of what we're talking about here. It's Holy Spirit, you and I do life together. When I rise, when I go to bed, even in my dreams, I pray that you are manifesting on me. I want to be where you are. And the Bible says in Colossians 1 that, that God's word, his very breath, the, the very spirit of God, it says, holds all things together and everything has its place and knows where to stay. And it's like this supernatural, mysterious um, super glue, like supernatural glue, you know, maybe. And it's like what holds everything together is through the Lord, right? And it's weird that we can do life every day and be rubbing against the supernatural reality that the fact that I have oxygen in my lungs, the fact that the earth is rotating on its axis, the fact that you and I are meeting in this room right now is because he's holding it together and we can be completely unaware of him. He is constantly 
active. He's constantly in motion. He's constantly uh, pursuing and, and moving in and to and for you, and yet we can miss him at times. And I think God wants to open our eyes this morning. I think there's an awakening in our soul that he wants to be very much alive in us. I mean, the spiritual reality is that Ephesians talks about this. It talks about how this is a mind blowing. Uh, I'm kind of tangenting here. But like it says, his fullness, God's fullness is when he fills us. That is wild. Like God's delight. I'm his fullness. Like, oh, like, God's smile on his face is when he is pouring himself into you and you're getting full of him. You're experiencing his presence, right? Like that's, that's unbelievable. It delights him. He, he's not resisting you. He's not saying, you know, you have to perform and do a dance good enough and maybe I'll give you attention. He is in hot pursuit of you. He's going, no, I, I want you to know me. I want you to experience my presence. I want to bring breakthrough. I want to give you wisdom and healing and hope and life. I want you to have all this stuff. It's us who turn away. It's us who do not acknowledge. It's not the other way around. He is so longing for it. I mean, even the spiritual reality, if, if you've confessed Jesus as Lord, the Bible says the Spirit of God lives within you. And then it says in Ephesians chapter 2, it says that he set you in heavenly places. What? Man, the Bible is wild. He has set you in heavenly places. There is a, re- a spiritual reality that you have full access to the throne room of God through his spirit all the time. But we don't always acknowledge it. And I really want God to, to if I could think of one phrase, I was praying like, God, what do I want? I just, I want you to have a hunger for more. Like if you could leave this morning and say like, what's the thing God wants to do? I want there to be something in you stirring, saying, oh, there's more that I can have in the Holy Spirit. There's more that God is offering and affording me that I can live empowered and with his thoughts because his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And there's, there's this, you know, that's Isaiah 55. There's this reality where God is saying, come, let me move in through you. I have a, I have a buddy named Kendall and, and, you know, sometimes churches can get, uh, bad raps because sometimes we deserve them, and um, and you know sometimes there's the phrase of like a dead church where like yes they have a service yes they have a meeting together but it's like no life is in the church like God's not there I don't know what to explain and about it but my my friend Kendall says there's no such thing as a dead church if I'm in it and he says because the Lord the Holy Spirit's not dead in me he 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 is full I'm yielded to him he can do move. I'm surrendered to him. He can overcome, he can speak, he can do whatever he wants in and through me. So if I'm in the room, then that room is alive because the Holy Spirit is alive in me. And I wanna say God's called us to be a very much an alive community, a live church. He's called for you to be fully alive. This is where Jesus says that the devil comes to steal, come, destroy, but I've come to give life and life abundant. That life abundant is when you are yielded to his spirit and you're letting him have his way in your life. That's when you go from being a religious person who's unsatisfied as Brother Lawrence was talking about, to someone going, I don't know how people are ever satisfied doing that when I live fully yielded and he has his way uh, through me every day. Like this is what God wants to awaken and stir in the soul of every one of us. So I'm gonna uh, gonna ask that we we just focus our attention this morning. I'm gonna start with one passage in Judges chapter six. So if you have your Bible, I'm just gonna look there, but we are actually gonna look at a lot of scripture this morning. I know that some people like when you just grab one big piece of scripture and you just kind of work through it. And I apologize for those who love that, but we're actually gonna look at like 10 scriptures this morning. And so, but there's a theme here of what God's speaking and I want, I want to draw our attention to it. And to give context as you're turning there to Judges 6, what's happening is uh, the people of God are once again not obeying God and they're worshiping other gods and they're causing all kinds of problems and it's creating hardship for them because when you disobey God, it doesn't go well with you. That principle still applies to us today. And so Israel is having hardship and there is the Midianites, this people that want to kill and destroy Israel. And they're worshipers of Baal, a false god. And they want to come and they want to kill Israel. So Israel does what Israel typically does is they realize we're screwed. So they start to cry out to God and say, bail us out. And then God does what God does. And he says, man, you're lucky I'm faithful to my covenant with you. <laughs> and he says, I love you and I'm faithful to you. So I will come and I will bring breakthrough. And so he shows up and and what happens is he goes to Gideon 
and he goes to Gideon, he sends an angel of the Lord to Gideon, he says, Gideon, and he calls him a mighty warrior. And he says, rise, mighty warrior, for I'm gonna use you to lead Israel out of this conflict with the Midianites. And what's so interesting is that, you know, Gideon is quick to immediately help clarify confusion for God, because God is obviously confused. And he's like, you know, God, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you this, but um, I'm the least of my family. Not only that, I'm the least, my family is the least of my tribe. And not only that, my tribe is the least of the 12 tribes of Israel. So I'm the, I'm the least of the least of the least of these. I think you got the wrong guy. Have you ever said that to Jesus? The Lord's like, hey, I have something for you. I wanna, I wanna give you a hope. I wanna give you a dream. I wanna, I wanna speak something over your life. I wanna give you something to, to contend for. And you're going, I, I think you have the wrong person. Right? That this is the Gideon experience here. We just have it recorded for all eternity. Poor Gideon, we all get to see his. Right? But we all know what we're talking about. We're going, God, that seems too big for me or too much or too much of an ask. Has God ever asked you too big of an ask? Again, side tangent. Luke one thirty seven. for nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible. That same passage translated in other translation, no spoken word of God does not perform, have the power within itself to perform what God is asking. So the moment God says, I'm calling you to this, is the very moment he's graced you with the power to do what he just told you to do. Side tangent, but we should know this, right? Okay, jump back in. So Gideon's going, got the wrong dude, okay? So then God says, I know, I know what you're capable of or the lack thereof, and that's exactly why I'm calling you because I want to show you my glory. I want you to see what it looks like when I have all authority, I get all the praise, and when I flex my muscle versus you trying to flex yours, right? And so through this exchange, God gives Gideon enough courage where they sneak into the other Midianites' territory, and he goes and he tears down these idols of Baal. And then they cut down these crops and then they this like grove and they use the wood from the grove to make an altar and then they make an altar to the Lord in the midst of the enemy after cutting down their false gods. I mean, radical, right? Pretty wild. Well, obviously the, the Midianites learn of this. They're not really cool with that. And they're like, we have a problem. So they gather all the people, the, the, there's the, 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 all the people that are against Israel, which is the Melchites, the Midianites, and all these Eastern people groups. And they gather them all together to wage war against Israel. And then now we're picking up in Judges 6, verse 33, and I'm gonna read verse 34 out loud with you all. It says, now all the Midianites and Melchites and all the Eastern people joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the Valley of Jezreel. They were about to now pounce on Israel, okay? But this, verse 34, then the spirit of the Lord came on Gideon and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Bizarites to follow him. So the, I know it might seem like, okay, we just read one verse. And I apologize for those who want more context, but we're gonna stop there. Then the spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. Will you read that with me out loud? Then the spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. That word came or came upon is Hebrew, it's called lavash. And it literally means to put on, to wear, to clothe, or specifically to be fully clothed. God put on Gideon. What's happening? What did you do, Lord? I'm gonna read it in the Amplified Version. But the spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon with himself and took possession of him. What'd you do, God? <laughs> I've been studying this passage and I've looked up multiple commentaries, many theologians, and almost all of them use the same visual imagery and they say, God put Gideon on like a glove. Isn't that wild? What does that even mean? I don't know, we're done. You know? <laughs> let's, let's go. <laughs> I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with this. I'm going, God, what does it mean? To be so yielded, that word keeps coming to mind, so you might hear that a lot, because that's been like the, the posture, the cry of my heart, me personally. I want to be yielded to you, Spirit of God. But I'm so yielded to you, God, that you could put me on like a glove, that you, you so indwell me, that you fill every part of me, that you have full access to all of my abilities, 
my thoughts, my words, my actions, my intentions, my life. Like you have control over me. And when God does this to get in, he then goes out and he brings victory for Israel. He does something supernatural because he yields himself and God comes upon him and God puts him on like a glove. Isn't that unbelievable? I believe God wants us to walk with the Holy Spirit, carry his presence so much that you would be able to say, it's like the Holy Spirit put me on like a glove. Like I was so, I was so under his control, not that I'm a zombie, not that I'm a robot, but that I'm so in agreement with the person of God that he doesn't have to fight with me. If he moves the finger, I move with him. If he reaches for something, I'm reaching for something. If he resists something, I'm resisting something. I'm, I'm, I'm walking and abiding in agreement with the Spirit of God. And I'm telling you, when we do this, when we choose to do it this way, it allows the Lord to have authority to where supernatural things can start to happen. Because God's not resisting our natural means of trying to take charge. It's a supernatural lifestyle that I believe the Bible's clear that it's for all believers. This is the life that God wants us to live. It's a yieldedness and a surrender. And I think the order matters. I just want to, if the focus of our lives become ministry, and we all have ministry, it's not because I'm a pastor that I use the word ministry. If you're a follower of Jesus, God's giving you a ministry to minister to the world around you and share and reveal Jesus to the world. That, that is a Christian call as a believer, okay? But if your focus becomes the ministry and not the person of the Holy Spirit, you're gonna have mixed motives and it's gonna get confusing. If it's, I need to do more for the Holy Spirit. I need to do more for God. If that's what leads your motivations you're gonna get compromised and it's gonna get confusing. And then when things don't turn out the way that you think they should, you're gonna get disillusioned. But if your focus is the person of the Holy Spirit, I wanna I want to be in a, an agreement with, I wanna know, I wanna love and be loved by the person of God more and more. I wanna walk with him. I, wanna, I want him to put me on like a glove, not because I can go do things for him, but because I can be that close to him. Whoa. Nothing separates me from the love of God. As if like it's a hand and a glove. When we do that, it helps us to guard the motives of our heart. But if we seek him only that we might be used and we have those mixed motives, part of which could be, I want to feel good about myself. So I want to do something that looks good. Or I just want to be happier with life. So I'm going to try to change something. Or... Um, I was trying to think through why our motives can get kind of, not necessarily, they're not bad in themselves, but they get off, you know? Or I want to be respected by my peers, so I want to do something great for God. The longing to do something great for God is not sinful. I believe God put that in your heart. But if your motive is to do things great for God and not to be in love with God himself, it's going to be an idolatry because you're going to start to worship the outworkings of your life or even the outworkings of the Holy Spirit through your life but yet you don't love the Holy Spirit himself. And so we want to make sure that the, the order is right. Does this make sense? So the order is this. First order is what has God afforded us? It's not what we've done. It's what has he done? And we say, whoa, the cross. Whoa, the cross. I was dead in my sin and he died for me. Wow, what, what have you afforded me is new life. Freedom from sin and guilt and shame. <sighs> You've afforded me so much. And then we see that he afforded us the Holy Spirit, Pentecost. He says, it's good that I go, that I might send you my spirit. And whoa, you, you give me your spirit that dwells with me, that I might walk with you everywhere I go. And there's nothing that can separate me from your love. What? That's where we start. And then from that place of approval, that place of acceptance, that place of love, we say, oh, that I might do step two, which is how do I respond in obedience to whatever you want to do? Where are you going? I'm going there. What are you doing? I'm going to do it. What are you thinking? I want to think it. What are you saying? I'm going to learn to say it. And you start to co-labor, co work together with the Lord. I, I believe this is really where God is wanting to take us as we're carriers of his presence. It's not just a momentary thing or an every now and then. It's a daily being clothed or actually he clothing us 
Like he puts us on like a glove. A couple other examples where I just saw this in scripture was, was Joseph. There's a time where Joseph interprets some dreams for Pharaoh. This is in Genesis 41. And he, he interprets these dreams and Pharaoh is so impressed and, and he even gives his suggestions on a plan. He says, this is what I think your dream means and this is what I think God's saying is a good plan. And it says in verse 37 that the plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his officials. So Pharaoh asked him, can we find anyone like this man, one whom is the spirit and whom the spirit of God? One in whom is the spirit of God? Like this is pre us getting the Holy Spirit. This is Old Testament, but God's going, the Pharaoh is taking note. Wow, the way that you carry the presence of God is marking you. Like, where did you get this wisdom? Where did you get this insight? Where did you get this power? Where did you get this authority? And it's because he was a devoted, yielded follower of Jesus. At that time, he knew the Father and the Holy Spirit. He didn't know Jesus, but it's the one God, the triune God. And he was yielded to him. And so we see this, in, in New Testament example, this one, these are hurting my head, so give grace, but Peter, in Acts 5, it says, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them in beds and mats out on the streets. And they were hoping at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds were gathering also that the towns around Jerusalem bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. There was something about, about Peter being put on like a glove by the Holy Spirit, that he could walk by a sick person, his shadow that lacks substance could, could go over someone and bring healing to somebody. That's crazy, right? That doesn't, that defies all logic and nature and, you know, what we know is to be normal. Because it wasn't about a proximity to a gift, it was, that, it was a proximity to a person. It wasn't the shadow that healed that person. It was the Holy Spirit being on the person. It was that, that that sick person came into proximity to the Holy Spirit on Peter. And then, and then Acts 19, later in the same book, there's Paul. It says in verse 11 of 19, it says, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that his handkerchief and aprons that had touched him were taken to sick and their illnesses were cured and even evil, evil spirits were left leaving them. What? I don't know the last hanky I blew into went and healed somebody. <laughs> like, this is crazy. But this is the Holy Spirit that we're called to clothe ourselves in and to carry and to steward and to walk with for every believer. And so when I say that, that might be offensive because you're going, but okay, you just gave Gideon and Joseph and then like two apostles, like Peter and Paul. Okay, they're exceptions. They had an unusual grace from God. And, and maybe they did, but I want to suggest that they didn't. And the reason why I want to suggest that, and there are people in the family of God who don't agree with me on this. So I feel obligated to share that with you so you can do, do your own study and your own venture with God through scripture on what you think about this, okay? But I'm going to preach my conviction this morning. And my conviction is that God wants to clothe all of us with his presence and use all of us for whatever he sees fit. And if it's a shadow, a hanky, or whatever else, he has his way. And so this idea that whatever is yielded to him is now saturated with him. So maybe we should say that the other way around. He saturates every part of anything that is yielded to him. Okay, now we've got to stop and think about that. <laughs> he saturates every part of anything that is yielded to him. So, are you yielded to him? Is he saturated, or are you, are you guarding, blocking off, keeping at bay certain things that you're not yielding, and so therefore he cannot saturate? The reason why I believe this is absolutely for today and not just for the select few is because I don't see that in scripture. I, can, I could get up and tell you hundreds, and I'm not exaggerating, of testimonies of why I don't think that's true based on experience. But according to scripture specifically, I don't see that being the case. Testimony is great. We want to have those testimonies, but we, our plumb line is the word of God. And, and when I read this, I'm going, okay, well, 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, do you not know that you yourselves are God's temple? 
and that God's spirit dwells in you and in your midst? So like, okay, so the, every believer gets the Holy Spirit. So it's not just for a select few. Every one of us that calls on the name of the Lord that is saved gets the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we have that. And then I'm reading John 14, 12. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Okay, hold on. What did Jesus do? Raise the dead? Anybody done that lately? Cast out demons? Heals the sick? Speaks words of knowledge, things he, he shouldn't know, but yet he knows? Words of wisdom? Has supernatural wisdom to transcend man's wisdom? He's tapping into a supernatural power through the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself yields himself to the Holy Spirit. So if Jesus needs to yield himself to the Holy Spirit, well, we need to yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit, yeah. right? And then I read Acts 2, after Pentecost, after the tongues of fire and the upper room experience, which there was more than just 12 people in the room, just as a proving my point a little further. There was more than just 12 in there. It wasn't just the apostles. It says, in the last day, verse 17, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on, say this with me, all people. We're gonna say this again, ready? All people. Who does he pour his spirit on? All people, okay? His desire is that he pour his spirit out on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servant, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. God wants to put you on like a glove. And he wants to speak and move and enjoy you. And he wants you to enjoy him and to be yielded in agreement with him. And he wants you to see things that you have no business seeing. He wants, to, he wants you to be a part of things that you have no business being a part. You're the Gideon going, I'm the least of the least of the least. And God's like, I know, but look what happens when you yield yourself to me. Nothing is impossible with God. So there's a couple things that I believe God's been highlighting to me of what causes restriction or resistance to the Holy Spirit moving through the believer. And I just want to draw our attention really quick to a couple of these. And the first one, the Bible uses the phrase grieving the Spirit. Grieving the Spirit. This is found in Ephesians 4, verse 30 through 32. It says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other just as Christ God forgave you. In Ephesians 4, to give context, this whole chapter is instructions for Christian and godly living. So it is actually giving a list of do's and don'ts. And specifically, and for the record, the Christian life isn't about behavior modification. It isn't like you just gotta be a really good person. That's every other religion that leads you far from God. Christianity is recognizing, absent of God, you are not a good person but he loves you so much that he wants to love, heal, and restore, and redeem you anyway, okay? So when I start talking about rules, don't start thinking you have to perform and earn something. You, you can't earn it. It's not possible, but he affords it to us through the cross, okay? So in this list, what he's saying is, hey, as one who is redeemed, who now has the Holy Spirit within you, start to respond to the convictions and the leadership of the Holy Spirit and start to get rid of sin, don't agree. You're no longer a slave, according to Romans, to sin, but a slave to righteousness. So yes, there's grace to forgive you of sin, but there's also grace to help you be empowered to live free from it. You don't have to be, well, I'm just, this is just what it is. I'm just, I'm just stuck in bondage. No, you, you really aren't. If you have the Holy Spirit, there is a grace for you to say, Holy Spirit, teach me how to agree with you today, that I might get rid of these things that are in conflict with you, that is grieving you. Because this list wasn't given to non-believers. This was given to the church of Ephesus. So it's like sitting in a church and he's saying, church, just quit sitting. <laughs> because it's grieving the spirit and he wants to put you on like a glove and he wants to move powerfully through your life and he wants to walk closely with you. But when you choose those other things, it actually hinders your, your sensitivity and your awareness and your agreement with him. And so sin can grieve the spirit of God. But when we choose righteousness, it's so good. And in Matthew 5, 6, I'm reading this one from the Passion Translation. It says, how enriched you are when you crave righteousness. For you will be surrounded with fruitfulness. Who doesn't want some fruitfulness in their life? First, the fruit of the Spirit, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control, right? We want the, the fruit of the Spirit, but even the, the fruit, the outworking of the Spirit, 
the healing, the words of wisdom, the knowledge, the grace, the, the discernment, the things we need to navigate this life with power that the world doesn't understand, but those who follow Jesus do. So my question is just what sin or disobedience are you needing to confess or repent this morning of? What is the thing that's in your life right now that you're saying this is causing the spirit to grieve and it's creating distance from me and the Holy Spirit? And I wanna encourage you that this morning, let's, let's get free from it. Let's, let's go to work and let's repent. I speak no shame, no condemnation. We're all in this together, but we all have things we can repent of. God, I wanna be in agreement. What are the things that's in me that's resisting you? The second thing that shows up in scripture is quenching the Holy Spirit. So you have grieving the Holy Spirit and you have quenching. Quenching is like what I think about is like a hose. When you have water flowing through a hose, you had a big old hose and it's flowing. That's like the Holy Spirit's moving. But when you quench, it's like kinking the hose. It's like, what's the thing that's like kinking the flow and the move of the Holy Spirit? And the first one is, is just a general resistance of God's voice and leadership in your life. Like, I don't want to pray about that. Have you ever have I had that moment? I don't want to pray about that. <laughs> I don't want to know what he's going to say, Right? But you know what you're doing? You're quenching the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit actually wants to tell you something that's gonna bring life to you. And you, you think you know better, but you don't. In humility, we have to be honest with that, we don't. He knows better. And we're quenching the flow of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 20, 22, it says this, do not quench the Spirit. So it flat out says it, don't quench the Spirit. But then it explains how you could be doing that. It says, do not treat prophecies with contempt but instead, test them all, hold on to what is good, and reject every kind of evil. So what it's saying is, and the word, this word prophecy or prophesia, it literally means when God is speaking. Like, do not reject when God's talking to you. Don't turn down the volume. Don't say, no, 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 or, okay, I'll pray about that more later, because I really didn't like what he said the first time, so I'll come back later. And, you know, but no, like, lean in to the Holy Spirit. I want to hear everything that you have to say. Speak to me. And if you're wrestling with just the idea of speaking to you, you're gonna wrestle with Jesus's words. Because in John 16, verses 12 through 15, it says, I have much more to say to you. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Hey guys, I got so much to tell you, but I don't have much time. And he says, more than I can bear now. But then verse 13 says, but when he, the spirit of truth, it's talking about the Holy Spirit, his presence comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and what he will tell you is what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that you will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said, to say, said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So this is what Jesus is saying. God tells the Son, Jesus. Jesus tells the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit tells you. That's the chain of communication through the triune God. Does that make sense? So that's what, it's, and that word will make known that is anageo, that literally means to report or to speak out loud. The Holy Spirit will report to you. He will speak to you what the, what the son just told him, which is what the father just told the son. Like, and this is not, again, just to a select few. This is to the church. Church, God wants to talk to you. He wants to talk to you individually. And yes, in his word, the Logos word is yes and amen and true forever. And anything you think you hear from God that's in contradiction to the word is not God. So that makes it easy to weed out a lot of stuff. Was that me or was that the Lord? Pray about it, read the Bible, and it'll help you, okay? And so as we, as we make known, as we listen and we let God speak, oh man, that's when things start to happen. I mean, my own theology in full transparency, I grew up in a Christian home with great Christian parents, and I loved Jesus at a, at a really young age. And I've even had supernatural experiences with God growing up. But I would say when I was in my mid to early 20s, my, my theology was more like Father, Son, and Holy Bible than it was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because I was nervous and unfamiliar with the Holy Spirit, right? Because it's interesting, you know, we know tons about Jesus who lived 33 and a half years, and we know more specifically about three years of his ministry time of his life than anything than we do of the last 2,000 years the Holy Spirit's been on the earth, know about the Holy Spirit. Like there's a mystery to him, there's an intimidation, but, but like, and I was captive to that, I'm going, I don't know, like, uh, and I have this guy named Jeff, and he's discipling me and investing in me, and he has the audacity to one day say, Adam, uh, what's God been telling you lately? And I was like, what do you mean, telling me lately? 
right? I was, I was giving the side eye. And he goes, you know, like when you pray and you spend time with God and he talks to you, what is he saying? And it, he, he thought it was a real simple question. And I like had a theological meltdown. And I'm going, uh, you're making me really uncomfortable right now, Jeff. And if you haven't loved me so much, I would be running for the hills. You know, but he'd been so faithful in being a good friend and caring for me that I, I was trusting him. And he goes, well, let's, let's start to lean into this. God wants to speak to you. The Holy Spirit wants to reveal himself. He wants, he wants to make known himself to you. So he says, hey, do me a favor and spend time with Jesus every day. Worship, pray, read your Bible, whatever. And he says, at the end of it, for five minutes, just sit there and say, God, if you have something to say, I'm listening. And he says, let's just do that for the next month and see what God says. So I'm like, all right, I'm very uncomfortable by it, but I love this man. So I say, okay, I'll do it. And a month goes by and we meet back together and he's so excited. He's like, Adam, how's it going? How's your five minutes a day going? What has God been saying to you? And I go, Jeff, he didn't say a dang thing. And I wasted five minutes a day and I was frustrated. I, I was mad at him. I was like, I can't believe you made me do that. Like, what a waste of time. Oh, I'm so sorry, Adam. And you know, you know what? Like, do me a favor. And I'm like, what? He's like, do it for another month. Another month? Are you crazy? I wrestled with it. And by the end of our time, I'm like, okay, I'll do it another month because you've loved me so well. Because I trust you, I'll do it because I want to honor you. So another month goes by and we meet back together. And he's so excited. Adam, how's it going? Tell me what God's been speaking to you lately. And I am tear-eyed. They're rolling down my cheeks and I'm angry. And I said, Jeff, you're a liar. You made me believe that God wanted to speak to me. Not just to, like, to anybody, but to me. That he had something specific for me. That God was that personal, like, like I could put him on like a glove. And he didn't say a thing. And I'm really, really upset with you. And Jeff sat down with me. He put his arm around my shoulder and he cried with me. And he goes, I'm so sorry. I don't know why God is being silent in this way. But what I do know is that God is a, a speaking God. What I do know is that God loves you and he wants to talk to you. I don't understand what he's doing. But will you do me a favor? <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> well, he said, will you give it one more week? I'm like, oh. I mean, it felt like such a huge ask. I said, all right, I'll give it, I'll give it, one, more, I'll give it one more week. So that ne next week, I'm, at this time, I'm not in ministry. I'm working as an architect and I hop on a commuter bus every morning and it's supposed to fit 40 people, but they somehow managed to fit like 60 to 70. And someone's armpit is like in my face, you know, and I'm like, you know, I, there's no room to sit. So I'm standing and you're just packed in like sardines and I'm riding to work. I had not prayed. I had not read my Bible. I had not worshiped. I had done nothing in regards to the Lord. I am running late probably because that's something I've improved in my life. But in that season of life, I was really great at running late. And um, I'm thinking about work and I'm thinking about the, the projects of that day. And as I'm riding in, my mind uh, starts to think about just the projects I need to do. And I'm not thinking about spiritual things. And when all of a sudden I hear, hey, Adam. So I look around the bus and try to say, okay, who do I know that's on here? I'm, just, I'm hearing things. It's no big deal. So I'm riding along and all of a sudden I hear, no, hey, Adam. I'm looking around again, and there's nobody. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me. And I look up at the ceiling of the bus, and I go, God? <laughs> this is a true story. God? He goes, yeah. I said, okay. <laughs> he goes, I want you to do something for me. I said, okay, what do you want me to do? And he says, do you see that girl? So he speaks like normal, it's not like King James Version. I thought, I was expecting a deeper voice, James Earl Jones style, King James. <laughs> he spoke my vernacular. It was like, hey, you see that girl? I'm like, what up, bro? Like, it was like common language. And I said, and what was crazy is 65 people on a bus, probably two-thirds are girls, and yet I turn around and I know exactly, for whatever reason, which one he's referring to. Young woman on my left, three rows back, sitting down. I look. Yeah, I see her. He goes, I want you to tell her something. I was like, well, sure. What, what do you want me to tell her? And he goes... I want you to tell her that I love her very much, that I'm aware of her current circumstance, but to not be afraid because I have a plan and a purpose for her life. So I'm like, you love her very much? Check, that's very biblical. Um, 
you know, don't be afraid. He says that more than any command in scripture to us is do not be afraid. And then he says, hey, plan a prayer, Jeremiah 20. Okay, yeah, uh, no. <laughs> he goes, excuse me? <laughs> and I had my Gideon moment. <laughs> Let me explain to you. I'm what you would call like a normal person. And um, as a normal person, like we don't, we don't do whatever this is and she for sure won't understand and all of a sudden give grace to this and I'm not, this never happened before or since, okay? But I had a very charismatic experience and God cramps my ab muscles up and I go down to one knee and I'm going, oh, oh, and I said, okay, okay, I'll tell her, I'll tell her whatever you want, you know? <laughs> and I'm now on one knee in the middle of this bus and then he releases him and I go, oh, and he goes, Adam, and he's speaking very gently. He goes, you've been asking for me to talk to you directly for two months and I've been waiting for the moment when your heart's ready to obey when I do, and you're still telling me no? And I just go, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I want, I want to learn to hear, and I want to learn to obey. And he says, okay. So I want you to tell her. <laughs> so then I look over, and again, this is another supernatural experience on the bus. She was three rows back, I promise. But now somehow she's three rows up, and she is directly next to me. I mean, like, her face is right here, and I look over, and we were like, like, I'm going cross-eyed. We're so close, you know? And I'm going, and she goes, can I help you? And I'm like, oh, yeah, um, well, uh, you know, I'm like so uncomfortable, you know? I'm like, uh, I was just um, pr- praying. Yeah, I was praying. That, that, I was praying, and I felt like God wanted me to tell you that he, he loves you very much, that he's aware of your circumstance, but not be afraid, and that he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And she goes, Thanks. Like, not impressed, super weirded out, kind of Valley Girl style. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay. So I stand back up, and I go, I did it. And the Lord goes, I'm so proud of you. And I'm, again, taken back. I go, what? And he said it again. He goes, I'm so proud of you. I said, but God, I, you had to cramp my ab muscles up. Like, how? Like, I didn't obey you well. He, no. You're learning, and I'm proud of you. And I'm like, well, you are so much nicer than people tell about you. Like, <laughs> like you are so kind, you know? And then, and all of a sudden, I look over, and now this girl is sobbing. She's losing it. So I go, that's your fault. <laughs> God, w- w- what do I do? He says nothing. I'm having an outward verbal conversation with the creator of the universe And I need him to come through because I've left this woman in a puddle of tears. And he says, nothing. God, hello. Hello. You know, is this thing working? You know, what do I do? And nothing. So then I'm thinking, okay, well, what would the Lord do? So I'm like, well, he draws near to the brokenhearted. He's a comforter. He's empathetic. I think I need to like comfort her. Okay. So I go back down and I said, hi. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't mean to upset you. And she's like, and she's like flicking her hand like this. Like, in my face. Like, and I'm sitting there, like, avoiding it. And, and I'm like, oh, okay, okay. Well, if there's anything I can pray for you about, like, I do love to pray for people. And I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm like, okay. So I, I get back up. And this is the world's longest commute, for the record. And so we're going on further. And eventually, I get to sit down. There's the aisle, and she sits down, but we're across from each other. It's been, like, 10 minutes. And all of a sudden, I feel a tap on my shoulder, and she goes, I thought of something. And, I, and I'm like, I'm sorry, what? And she goes, I thought of something for you to pray for me about. And I said, oh, good. So I kind of turned, I leaned closer to her, and I said, tell me. And she goes, well, I, I just found out that I'm pregnant. And I was like, congratulations. Like, I couldn't tell if it was a good thing or a bad thing, you know? And she was like, she's like, well, she's like, I definitely want to keep the baby. And I was like, okay. And she goes, but the guy was in a serious relationship. It was more of a fling. And I was not planning on having a future with this guy. I said, oh, wow. She goes, yeah, so I don't know what to do. And she goes, and then to make matters way worse, she goes, there's a genetic thing in my family where um, if we have a certain gene, um, we either have stillbirths or the babies are born with deformities, and it, there's a high probability I have this gene, and I'm really worried about the health of my baby. And I said, oh, man. I said, what's your name? And she goes, my name's, my name's Missy. And I said, hi, Missy, my, my name's Adam. Can I pray for you? And she goes, no. And I actually like this part of the story because it's real life, right? It's not always going to be oh, yes, thank you. You know, it was, no, that would make me uncomfortable, is what she said. And I said, I can totally respect that. Um, Can I have permission when I leave here today that every time God brings you to mind, I pray for you? And she goes, I'd like that a whole lot. I said, okay. 
So we eventually move on with the day. I get off the bus. She gets off the bus. Life moves on. It's now three months later. It is a beautiful Boston day, and I'm walking through the city. I choose not to take my normal bus route. I take a very different one because I want to walk as long as I can in the sunshine in Boston, which doesn't happen very much. So I'm enjoying it, walking, and I get on some random bus stop over in Copley Square. And the bus driver says, hey, it's going to be a few minutes before we leave. You're the only one on the bus. And I said, that's fine, because I'm currently in the discipleship school, plug for the discipleship school. And uh, I have a lot of reading to do. Not as good a plug for the discipleship school. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, he helps me lead the discipleship school. That's why he's laughing so hard. Um, and so I'm, I'm in the back. I have a book open. My face is in the book. And all of a sudden, I hear, Adam, Adam. And I look up, and it is Missy. And she is running down the center aisle, full bore, and she swings in. She hits me with her booty, knocking me over a seat. And she sits in my seat, and she goes, I have so much to tell you. Uh, Oh, please, please do. And I put the book away, and I'm like, what's going on? She goes, so much has happened in my life since the last time we met. I said, yeah, well, tell me. And she goes, well, the first thing is, she's like, you remember about the baby? And I said, yes. And I, it was the grace of, I can remember the date of her, of her doctor's appointment. I can remember all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, you said this date, I've been praying. What did the doctor say? She goes, my baby is totally healthy. So I praise God, Missy. She goes, I know, I'm so, I'm so excited. And she goes, it gets better. And I said, well, how does it get better? And she goes, you know the guy who was kind of a fling? I said, yeah. She goes, we're engaged. And I was like, no way. I'm like, it's God's desire for a husband and wife to be together and for a child to be raised in a home. I'm like, that's, but mom and dad, like, that's a good thing. And she goes, I know. I'm like, oh, praise the Lord. And she goes, but no, Adam, it gets better. And I said, how, how does it get better, Missy? And she goes, well, she goes, I, uh, I end up going with my now fiance to the church down at the corner after that next Sunday after I met you. And, and we met a pastor there and he told us about Jesus. And he told us about how Jesus died for our sins and that if we choose to walk with Jesus, we can have new life in him. And she goes, I I gave my life to Jesus. I was like, sorry, I I still feel it. What? She goes, yeah, me and my fiance gave our life to Jesus. We're going to raise this baby in a home that loves God. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And so she starts crying. I start crying. And we cry together for like a 30-minute bus ride home. And I got off the bus, guys, and I was like dancing and spinning, and I didn't care who saw me, and I was clicking my heels. I mean, I was like, holy cow, what can happen if God puts me on like a glove? What could happen if we just agree with the Spirit of God? What could happen if I say no to sin and yes to whatever he wants to do? What could happen if I don't grieve him or quench him, but I just say, God, whatever you're up to, can I please be a part of it? I don't need to be the leader. I don't need to be the best. I just want to be where you are. And I want to be where you are right now with my family of God. I want to be with you tomorrow morning when I rise up and when I, when I go to work and, and then when I'm with my kids at their sporting events or when I'm at the coffee shop or whatever. God, I just want to be wherever you are. What would happen, church, if we carried his presence like that? This is the invitation of God. This is the life abundant. This is what God promises. He wants us to agree with him. He wants us to hear from him. And he wants us to respond in obedience to him. Not because he wants a bunch of minions, but he wants a bunch of people to love. He wants to tell you how much he loves you. And he wants you to then learn how to love him rightly in response. Will you stand with me? We're going to have a time. This is the flipperoo, right? This is the time where we're going to have the band come forward. And I just want to go ahead and invite the band to come on up. We're going to have a time of, of, of extended response worship time. But this is the thing. These are the questions that, that I was processing as, in my own life. I was going, God, what sin or disobedience is grieving you? Like, where is there this place in my life and you're going, I want to I wanna be with you and I want to I wanna move through you, but you're resisting me. Or, God, the next question was, okay, God, like, where, God, am I, am, I, am I quenching you? Where are you speaking or wanting to move in such a way, but I'm saying that doesn't agree with my theology or that doesn't agree with my reputation or my lifestyle 
And God's going, I, I want you to lay all that down this morning. I just, I feel this, such an urgency in the spirit of God going, don't waste another breath. I even, I've, I've had him at times go and, and remind me of that story about Missy. And he said, how many Missies have walked by you today that you weren't willing to agree with me on? And he wasn't saying that out of shame. He wasn't beating me up. He was just going, there's more. I offer more than you're settling with. <laughs> going back to the, the, the Brother Lawrence quote, like why do religious people settle with something less than the practicing of his presence every day. Like what a lame walk with God. What a, what a mediocre low bar with Jesus. When he says, I can give you life abundant and to the full where, where we can walk and agree with each other in such a way that not only do you get to have my fullness, but I can do things with you that are extraordinarily far above your own ability. Where I get all the glory and you get to experience adventure with me. I want to invite our, um, our ministry team forward. And, um, and I want to invite anybody on, in our prophetic community, if you guys want to participate, you can, but just to pray and, and, and prophesy over people. But I want this to be a, a very intentional time. This isn't a time to check out. This is actually the time of leaning in. This is the, I'm going to carry your presence, God. I'm going to, I'm going to invite you to put me on like a glove. And anybody who's respond, uh, the response team, if you need to respond, you guys can just turn around and get right on your knees if you want. But I just want to invite anyone and everyone. Actually, my, my plea is this. Please don't leave without responding. Please don't play church. Please don't be satisfied with a religious experience in God. He offers us far more, far more. And so the band's going to lead us and if you need to come up and kneel, if you want to kneel at your chair, if you want to grab a friend and say, can you pray with me? If you want to come up and get any prayer from any of my wonderful friends up here, like we love to champion inviting the Holy Spirit into conversation. So don't delay, come now. You don't even have to wait for me to pray. Like if you want to respond to God, let's just respond to the Lord. But I'm going to pray and let's be those who lean in and say, God, I don't want to resist you. I don't want to grieve you. I don't want to quench you. But I want to be yielded to you. And whatever is yielded is fully saturated by you. So Jesus, that's, that's the prayer this morning. Will you come and will you fully saturate us, God? Will you put us on like a glove? Would there be an, an, an indwelling and a stirring in the heart of us, God, that, that, that you can move freely in and not have to resist, God? I pray, Father, for any of us that feel like, oh, that's just for the special, the, the chosen, the elect. God, if they confess you as Lord, they're it. You're available to us. And so God, may we choose not to settle for less. God, we lean into your presence this morning. We say, come have your way. In Jesus' name, amen.